eat solid food and then eventually become entirely weaned, that even a, you know, a toddler, two years old but completely weaned from breast milk, their gut microbiota is very adult-like. And at that point, they probably have a gut microbiota that's going to be similar to what they keep through their life. Gotcha. And the brothers and sisters or twins in the same household are going to have a more similar community because they're com it's coming from that same environment than people that live in different houses or different countries. Gotcha. But they won't be exactly the same, to some extent, just a little bit by chance. Sure. To some extent, maybe, because they eat different things. How about, um, I think a lot of people might be interested in this. If one of the, would it be possible for a scientist like yourself to be taking stool samples from someone for, I don't know, let's say a week every day and looking at them. But let's say that the patient or the person that you're working with goes out and has a big night on the town drinking like crazy, yeah. all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of beer, things like that. Do you think that that would be evident in the data from the stool sample? It's quite possible. We don't know Okay. Uh, until we actually do the experiment. And, and I don't know uh, to what extent it might be the alcohol itself that would have an effect. Because, gotcha. Uh, for the gut microbiota, um, the alcohol won't trans translate all the way through the, the gut and stay there. The alcohol will be fairly quickly absorbed into the body and metabolized in the body. Okay. So it's not as though you're looking at beer in the gut, but you may well be looking at the byproducts, you know, the acid aldehyde that our liver produces as it detoxifies the alcohol. That's going to be circulating in our blood. It's going to get back into our gut. Gotcha. And that could affect it might be what's what, happening. So, too, that would well, be too we, difficult then to say exactly. Uh, right. But, well, we don't know but um, what, what would be causing the effect, but we certainly could see an effect. We do know from diet studies, uh, it's in mice, just a single day on an altered diet is enough to see a dramatic change in the composition of the microbes in their gut. And what, what would be an example of like a dramatic change well, a study, for the mice? A study that's been done or what, is what they, the they food had mice be? on uh, a typical mouse chow diet, which is a what you think of What's as mouse chow the high, the high, uh, you know, high plant polysaccharide diets. Seems okay. like a healthy diet, you know, lots of lots of plant fiber, you know, some protein and fat, but a okay. lower amount. They put gotcha. these things. On, it, it was a mouse diet still, but it was the equivalent of a typical American Western diet. High fat, high protein. Gotcha. Uh, and so this group that does a lot of work with mice, they basically had a diet that for them represented the high fat, high protein, typical American diet. Within a day of switching mice from their typical lab chow to health food, mouse health food diet, to the Americanized diet, the community change dramatically. There was a different set of populations that became abundant. Some of the same ones persisted. Some of the ones that had been there went down in abundance and others that had not been seen before or were very rare before became quite abundant. And I'm sure that some of the normal fluctuation that we see, even when people aren't going out for a night in the town or aren't going out to dramatically change what they eat, just the normal fluctuations we see I'm sure in large part is driven by what you happen to eat. You happen to eat a meal, you know, rich in onions, and there's certain chemical compounds that are a little bit different than onions than most food, and there'll be certain bacteria that will grow. You eat a diet, you know, you, ha you have whole wheat bread and you usually don't, and now there's going to be a different set of bacteria that can degrade certain plant starches that you now got a big dose of, but mm -hmm. aren't usually there. Wow. Interesting. And that obviously goes back to what the effects of diet can be for, for UC. Sure. Because there are going to be different bacterial populations that will grow. Some strains that will rise in abundance and other strains that will fall mm -hmm. based on what resources they get. And they don't get everything you eat. You know, when we eat kind of a normal uh, diet, much of the fat and protein in our diet is absorbed, is digested and absorbed by our body in the stomach and the small intestine before it ever gets down to the large intestine where most of the bacteria are. 
Gotcha. But if you eat a high enough diet with high enough fat and, and protein, there is some of that that, that goes through. And uh, the bacteria that tend to degrade the fats and the oils and the amino acids that are the building blocks of protein, they tend not to be as, as healthy for us. Okay. The type of bacteria that we think of as the bacteria we want to encourage in our gut, they largely are degrading polysaccharides, chains, carbohydrates. What are some examples of, like, at the grocery store, Fiber. polysaccharides? Okay. Uh, when you look at, you know, carbohydrates, carbohydrates range from simple sugars, I mean, just sugar is a carbohydrate, uh, and white bread is mostly carbohydrate. It's just chains of sugar molecules locked together. But those tend to be simple carbohydrates that are easily broken down and tend to be absorbed by the body fairly easily. Complex carbohydrates are the vegetable fibers, things you get from eating all the veggies you should be eating in a, in a day, or eating whole grain uh, bread and pasta rather than white bread. Okay. Uh, you know, brown rice instead of white rice. They are harder to break down for our body, or they're impossible to break down for our body, so they pass through and they become the main food source for the bacteria in our large intestine. Ah, okay. So there's I got you. another important food source for the bacteria in our large intestine is our own polysaccharides. We produce mucus lining our mm -hmm. gut, and that mucus sloughs off and moves on down, and there's bacteria that can make a living in our gut, essentially degrading our own mucus. Wow. Um, it's also primarily a polysaccharide. Interesting. Leslie, I want to ask you a question about going back to your study. So you, when you had these patients prior to giving them the antibiotics, mm -hmm. you were able to develop a, um, an idea for where their bacteria communities were at. Mm -hmm. and this that, is the, some fluctuation, but this is an average state for this person. Here's the average state for a different person. And that was developed over a period of time, taking samples, uh -huh. and so you, you had a, a range, but a, a very decent idea as where things were at. Yeah. And then you introduced the antibiotics. Uh -huh. And what was it? It was like an eight or ten day? It was just five days. Or five day course, okay. It, it would be the antibiotic ciprofloxacin, the way it would typically be prescribed if you had a urinary tract infection. Okay. Simple, uncomplicated, five days, relatively short I course. I think I was prescribed that within the past year and a half for an ear infection yeah. as well. It was either by the fluid kind of ear type thing. stuff or urinary tract or the typical okay. uses of Cipro these days. Common antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So the three people were given the antibiotics and then you were taking samples during that five days. Uh -huh. What did you notice? For the first three days, almost nothing changed. Okay. Uh, so it was on about the fourth day of taking the antibiotics that we saw a dramatic change in the community. And it's not surprising there'd be this lag, you know, the stuff in our gut takes time to work its way out. It takes time for the concentration of the antibiotic to, to build up. But it was reasonable that three days we start to see an effect, and the effect was very, very quick. There were populations that had been at high abundance that within a day or two dropped. They were either absent or very close to absent, as far as we can tell. There are other populations that had been quite rare and became far, far more abundant. And we're talking about changes like being um, one in 10 million or one in a million uh, for some of these strains that then became uh, one out of a thousand or one out of a hundred of all the cells. Wow. That. So, you know, Big 10, increases. 20, you know, hundredfold, thousandfold change in abundance. And these on types of bacteria that we're very, very minimal prior were well, all over the place. I have to say, some bacteria remained. Sure. Maybe went up and down a bit or stayed fairly level, so not everything changed. The ones that changed, oftentimes when one uh, strain of bacterium would decrease, another reasonably closely related strain of bacteria would increase. Wow. So to some extent there may have been some balance. Okay. And it's true that none of the people taking the antibiotic in this study had any symptoms. They 